Welcome to episode 3. Great to have you with us today. Today we hear from 2 Samuel and we see that peaceful resistance to change in our life is the answer. In 2 Samuel chapter 21, we hear of Rizpah mourning for her sons and we see the importance of public grief and how that can inspire action and change. Whether that's the story of Rizpah or the story of Aotearoa New Zealand and Parihaka, or whether that's the current movement in the US of Black Lives Matter. Grab your Bible now and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 21. don't have your Bible, push pause, grab it, and then we can start with our reading. I'm reading today from 2 Samuel chapter 21, and to add just a little bit more context, I'm going to start at chapter 3 verse 7, but you don't need to be there, chapter 21. So this is chapter 3 verse 7. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, daughter of Ahah. And Ishal said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Now we're turning to chapter 21 in 2 Samuel, and I'm reading from verses 1 to 14. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said, There is a blood guilt on Saul and on his house, because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had tried to wipe them out in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? How shall I make expectation that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, It is not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put anyone to death in Israel. And he said, What do you say that I should do for you? And they said to the king, The man who consumed us and planned to destroy us, so that we should have no place at all in the territory of Israel. Let seven of his sons be handed over to us, and we will impale them before the Lord at Gibeon, on the mountain of the Lord. The king said, I will hand them over. But the king spared Meshubim, the son of Saul's son, Jonathan, because of the oath the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. The king took the two sons of Rizpah, daughter of Iha, whom she bore to Saul, Amari and Meshbethah, and the five sons of Merib, daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, son of Bashirli, the Melamite. He gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they impaled them on the mountain before the Lord. The seven of them perished together, and they were put to death on the first days of the harvest, at the beginning of the barley harvest. Then Rishpah, daughter of Aha, took sackcloth and spread it on the rock for herself, from the beginning of the harvest until rain fell on them from the heavens. She did not allow the birds of the air to come on their bodies by day, or the wild animals by night. When David was told of Rishpah, daughter of Aha, the concubine of Saul, and what she had done. David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the people of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hung them up on the day that the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa. 
He brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those who had been impaled. They buried the bones of Saul and of his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin and Zelah, in the tomb of his father Kish. They did all that the king commanded. After that, God heeded supplications for the land. That was Second Samuel, chapter twenty-one, verses one to fourteen. Peaceful resistance to the change in our life is the answer. As Rishpa mourns his sons, we see the importance of public grief and that that can inspire action and change. Whether that's the story of Rishpa or the story of Aotearoa New Zealand and the story of Parihaka, or whether it's the current movement in the US of Black Lives Matter. Now, I don't know if you've read Second Samuel, the story which we've heard today before, But I'm assuming that most of you have never heard the story which we've heard of Rispa today. Because it's a story that never comes up in our um, Sunday cycle of readings. We hear parts of 2 Samuel and parts of 1 Samuel. But this is a story which we never hear in worship. And overall the story of Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel, is heartbreaking. It begins with the people crying out and saying, we no longer want our system of government. We wish to have a king. We wish to have a king who is a conqueror like the other kings. And Samuel tells them that this will only bring death and destruction. But the people rebel. They insist on a king. They insist on a king of war. And Saul is anointed king and later David. And these two kingdoms, the kingdoms of Saul and the kingdom of David, constantly fight each other and other kingdoms around them. There are snippets of good, but the story is largely a story of heartbreak. And it's certainly not a G-rated story. To one, in one respect, it's the story of the worst of life. And what can go wrong, does go wrong. And in today's story, we hear of the tragedy of Rishpa. Now Saul has multiple wives, and one of them is Rishpa. We know nothing of her except for this story. There's a famine in the land, uh, no food can grow, and for three years nothing has grown. Three years, imagine that. And when the famine doesn't stop, when food doesn't grow, Saul murders, sorry, David murders Rishpar and Saul's sons, hoping that this murder will break the famine. And it's King David who facilitates this murder. After Rishpar's sons are lynched on a mountaintop, they're left there to rot and to do- and to, well, that's it, just left to rot. No one is given to Rishpar to help her bury her sons. Instead, she is there with them on the mountaintop. Now, in the ancient Near East, in those days, not having a funeral for someone and not burying the dead was a common way to curse and punish your enemy. So Rishpa stays with her murdered sons for months so that their bodies aren't mutilated. Day and night, protecting them from predators, from rats, from birds. She's with her son's bodies for months on end, from harvest time right through to the rainy season, probably something like six to eight months, until David eventually has compassion on her and comes and buries her sons. Every day, Rishpa through staying with her son's bodies, testifies to the abuse that she suffered at David's hand. She sleeps, she eats, 
and she protects her son's bodies all in one place. She's on a mountaintop for months. Her public grief is eventually responded to. And King David retrieves not only the bodies of Rishpah's sons, but also the bodies of Jonathan and Saul that he never bothered to up until this point. And he gives these bodies a proper burial in Saul's family's grave. Moved by her actions, staying on the mountain, David retrieves these bones. It was a long time ago too, when Jonathan and Saul died. But David is starting to try and right some of his wrongs. As Rishpah mourns her sons, we see the importance of public grief and that that can inspire action and change. So how do we grieve in the wake of unthinkable loss, in the wake of that level of injustice? Rizpah shows us unapologetic grief through her persistent strength and honouring the innocent lives of those taken from her. Her public unravelling motivates the king to amend his ways as best he can. He starts to amend some of his wrongs, as King David then buries Saul and Jonathan in Rizpah's sons. So what started to unravel, or what's unravelling? Well, of course, Rizpah's family and family life have unravelled. And Rizpah's public grief starts to unravel into activism. Imagine deciding to be there on the mountaintop until someone finally comes and buries your son's bodies. King David, of course, is starting to unravel too. He realises that his cure for the famine won't work. His belief starts to unravel and he acts more justly. God's call has always been to care for and to look after the poor and the oppressed. But it's a call that those in power largely ignore. And in all kinds of ways, we need to peacefully protest oppression. I think our best example in Aotearoa, New Zealand, was of the colonial invasion of Parihaka, where the local Maori people, they had heard the gospel, and they welcomed in their invaders in peace and with warm bread. They peacefully protested the invasion of the area. And that happened on the 5th of November. But instead on the 5th of November, we remember a failed attempt to blow up the British Parliament. Not a very good remembrance of Parihaka. Another great example of peaceful protest was the Bastion Point protests. And shortly before this was the Hikoi that Dame Finney Cooper led. We need to constantly and peacefully protest the injustices around us because injustices aren't righted unless we protest. The movement of the moment is Black Lives Matter and that's a movement that started in 2014 but of course it traces its lineage back to well before then in the black civil rights movements in the US. Six years on, though, there's still a lot to be done. And today, we remember how Rispar mourns her sons. We see the importance of public grief and that that can inspire action and change. When we get something wrong, we must change. We must go through some process of restitution Now that restitution doesn't make everything from the past okay or right, but it does start to signal for us a change of heart. And we see that in Aotearoa with the Waitangi Tribunal, slowly going through a restitution process. So today we give thanks for the strength of people like Rispa 
and Dame Finney Cooper, who had the courage to say, this is not right. Today, though, we also know that leaving the protests up to a couple of people isn't enough. It requires you, it requires me to also go, this isn't right. We need change. To live God's ways, we all need to work together. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, may you stir within us a spirit for peace and for justice. May we thirst for justice until all are heard. May we always work for your ways. And may we shun the ways of power and oppression. Give us the courage to live as you call. Amen. You'll find some questions down below in the description field. I'd encourage you to push pause as you go through these and to truly think about them and what they might signal for you. So let me share with you the questions. The first thing we discover about Rizpa is that she's a low status wife of King Saul. Now, so she was a concubine. Now, while she was a wife of King Saul, her sons um, weren't entitled to any form of inheritance. So she was of very low status. We also discover that she's been raped by Abner, who was Saul's nephew and the former commander of his army. So knowing this, how does that shape your understanding of Rizpah's social location? In other words, what political sway would have she had? What about examining the story through the lens of power? Who has power in the story? And who doesn't have power? And if we turn our attention to Rispa, how does she move from a position of powerlessness to ultimately create change? And thinking of today, what might some public examples, what might some examples be today of public grief in the wake of appalling injustice? As we look around, what do we see that we need to cry out and grieve for? And thinking of action, how does honest and public acts of grief affect others? Next week, next week we're in Luke's Gospel. We're looking at Zacchaeus, the wealthy tax collector, and how his vocation radically unravels. So I look forward to having you with us next week as we look at Zacchaeus. As we close today, a blessing. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. And may God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, starvation, rejection, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. And the blessing of God who creates, redeems and sanctifies be upon you and all who you love and pray for this day and forevermore. Amen. <music>